but just for one moment, let's picture what we could see if it were possible to visit some of these satellites of Uranus and have a look at Uranus from there. First of all, here's a photograph, uh, here's a drawing, I'm sorry, by David Hardy, the astronomical artist, and this shows Uranus as it might be from one of its moons. Of course, it is only an artist's impression. It may very well be wrong, we just don't know, but at least it's reasonable, and Uranus might really look like that. Hey everyone, I just wanted to share this little clip that I found um, recently. I'd actually been watching a, a documentary series just on Irish castles, uh, just for the fun of it, and just happened to watch this section where they were talking about this Durr Castle and uh, the telescope that was there. So I went and looked into it some more and came across this piece that was done by Sir Patrick Moore, who had a long-running television show uh, on astronomy on the BBC for many decades. So this is back in the 60s, and he's talking with the, the current Earl of Ross, I believe. Um, you know, the, the, the current caretaker of the castle at the time. But it's interesting because one thing they don't mention in this piece, but in the documentary series that I saw and other and elsewhere, the first thing that jumped out at me was that the nickname of this uh, telescope was actually the Leviathan. That's what everyone called it. Which, of course, on the surface level, people would probably you know, assume is just because it was so huge and it was, of course, really big, but uh, there's also the myth, the very interesting mythological, um, you know, connections to, to Leviathan and, you know, being the, the sea monster in the deep, in the great deep. And I did a, a video a while back exploring the, the possible connections between uh, the Leviathan and the Ouroboros and uh, the Milky Way, actually, but so, pretty weird. Looking at the telescope now, when it's more or less in a horizontal position, I find it a bit difficult to visualize what it must have looked like when pointing, well, pretty well straight upwards. Was it, in fact, as difficult to use as some people have said? It well, must have been extremely complicated, certainly to an amateur like myself. To begin with, it was extremely heavy yeah. and cumbrous. Uh, there was no, uh, no automatic machinery. Everything had to be worked by hand by a, a sort of elaborate system of uh, winches and weights which were carried into great holes on either side of these walls. So the telescope was literally pulled up on, on, on winches, really? <laughs> yes, it was, quite literally, and there was this a whole team of men who had always to be in attendance when it was to be in use. Uh, how exactly did the astronomer look through it? I mean, uh, how did he get up to the position of the eyepiece, which obviously must be at the top of the tube? Well, there was a sort of wooden platform which he could get in and out the whole way up, you see. Yes. Because the staircase went right up to the top of the west wall. Yes. And there was a gallery along the top of that. And there was another staircase going inside this wall. And so you could get in and out of your platform at any moment. I see. And you look through the rectangle down at the speculum at the base of the machine. I think you know that when you have that kind of mechanism uh, worked manually, it's really rather amazing that with a small field, he, uh, Lord Ross could in fact see these distant objects well enough to draw them as well as he did. Uh, well, I've often thought it quite extraordinary. And there is the Irish climate, which he had to contend with, too. Yes, but he certainly did it most successfully. Mm -hmm. When did all this come to an end? Because there must be people alive who still remember it. I believe that the telescope had fulfilled its useful life, by and large, when my great-grandfather died. But it was used for showing to interested spectators, for demonstration purposes, shall we say, until my grandfather's death in 1908. Bearing in mind the time when it was built, the achievements of this Ross 72-inch reflector are quite remarkable. Remember, it was ready in 1845, and the mirror, which is six feet across, which is on the, on the, and that's my height, very much larger than anything previously built, was optically good by the standards of the time. It was made of a specular metal, which is an alloy, and it was actually the last really big specular metal mirror ever made, because after that, people went over to glass. And it's rather interesting, too, that no larger mirror was actually made until the Mount Wilson 100-inch, and that went into action during the First World War. The Ross mirror had to be repolished every month, and that was quite a job. The whole thing needed a lot of maintenance, and the third Earl left very detailed instructions of just how this was to be done. 
The fourth Earl continued the observations with the big telescope for some time, and I think it's probably true to say that the most important work by the big 72-inch was done in the first period of its career. Its great strength lay in its light-gathering power, which was very much greater than any other telescope made up to that time. Remember, what you want to do in astronomy is to see very faint things. And to see very faint things, you need to collect as much light as you can get. And the bigger the mirror, well, the more light you can correct. And this is where the big Ross mirror came in. With the 72-inch eye, the third Earl looked at those strange misty patches in the sky uh, known as nebulae. No one at that stage knew quite what they were, and no one had ever really seen their shapes, because to see the shapes, you do need tremendous light grasp. Well, with this telescope, Lord Ross could do that, uh, and he did. And he found out that these nebulae, or many of them, were in fact shaped like spirals, like tremendous catherine wheels. And this was a completely new discovery. It was also one of the early indications that these things aren't contained in our own Milky Way, but are in fact a long way out, beyond our own particular star system in space. For a long time, only the Ross telescope could show the spiral nature of these galaxies. And so, in fact, if you wanted to see a spiral galaxy, well, you just had to come here to Burr Castle. You couldn't see it from anywhere else. And, in fact, in astronomical history, there have been three great telescopes which have altered the entire course of astronomical thought. The latest of them is the 200-inch at Palomar. Before that, there was the 100-inch at Mount Wilson. And the first of the line was the 72-inch here at Burr Castle. There was another point, too. Remember, this was before the days of accurate astronomical photography, so you couldn't really photograph the spiral galaxies. So you had to draw them, and this is where the 72-inch again came in. And luckily, Lord Ross himself was a very skillful artist, and he made drawings of these things, and some of those drawings still exist here in the library at Burr Castle. Reproductions of them went all over the world. And really, you know, when you come down to brass tacks, this is the beginning, really, of all modern cosmology, because it was only then that we really found out just what these things looked like. So that was kind of interesting. But just the history of this telescope, like he says, is that it was the, it was the biggest telescope in the world for uh, about 100 years, and was essentially how they supposedly discovered that galaxies were distant clusters of stars, um, you know, outside of our own galaxy. So, as he said, it was one of the pivotal telescopes in, in forming the modern conceptions of, of cosmology. So, pretty significant thing to, you know, to, to consider and look into. Uh, and like he says, they, they weren't able to take photographs through it. They just would just make hand drawings, you know, so, which is interesting because I don't know how many people realize that that was kind of similar to what Galileo did, was just look through his telescope and make drawings of, of things, and yet, and that was the very, you know, technical process by which they established so many of the fundamental assumptions and discoveries that were always just confirmed later by, supposedly by, by photography and more advanced technology. But it's interesting too because this Lord Ross guy, I did a little, I did a little bit more research into him and he wasn't just some duke, he was actually, <laughs> surprise surprise, president of the Royal Society. And I believe, and if I remember correctly, I believe he became president of the Royal Society like the same year that he discovered that, you know, galaxies were these spiraling clusters of stars. So interesting coincidence there. Of course, there's no such thing as coincidences, but... But then, <laughs> after I was watching this thing, I kind of rabbit-trailed and was watching other episodes of this Sky at Night program from the 60s with, with Patrick Moore, and I came across this one. I just wanted, <laughs> wanted to share this with you as well, because the episode is, is actually about Uranus, but he talks about Jupiter and Saturn uh, at the beginning, and I specifically just wanted to show you this image of Jupiter that they show because uh, when I saw it, I, I couldn't really believe that they were, you know, passing, trying to pass this off as, as real. Of course, at the time, they had nothing else to compare it to, but when you compare it to the images that NASA has put out now, it's uh, it's pretty comical. So check this out, and you tell me if this if right. they seem to but line up. But it didn't up. really come up to expectations, and remember, I warned you that it might not. It's uh, become very faint now. Neither is it a very good time at the moment for seeing the planets. Mercury and Venus and Mars are all so badly placed that, to all intents and purposes, they are out of view altogether. And that leaves us with the two giants, Jupiter and Saturn. Jupiter's making quite a brave show, and you can see it in the southern part of the sky late at night. It looks like a very brilliant star, 
and in fact it's so bright that you can't really mistake it. If you've got a telescope, you'll be able to see its belts and its moons. This is a picture of Jupiter, which also shows that extraordinary feature, the Great Red Spot. Jupiter will be, will be better placed later on this year, and I'll say more about it then, but I'm afraid it is going to be rather inconveniently low for observers in Britain. the yellowish star. I think the best way to find it at the moment is to uh, identify Jupiter and then look over some way towards the east and about the same height above the horizon. And you will see Saturn there shining quite conspicuously and rather on its own. And of course the small telescope will show the rings quite clearly. caretaker of the castle at the time but it's interesting because one thing they don't mention in this piece but in the documentary series that i saw in other and elsewhere the first thing that jumped out at me was that the nickname of this uh telescope was actually the leviathan that's what everyone called it which of course on the surface level people would probably you know assume is just because it was so huge and it was of course really big but uh there's also the myth the very interesting mythological um you know connections to to leviathan and you know being the the sea monster in the deep in the great deep and i did a, a video a while back exploring the the possible connections between uh the leviathan and the ouroboros and uh, the milky way actually but so pretty weird but just for one moment let's picture what we could see if it were possible to visit some of these satellites of uranus and have a look at uranus from there first of all Here's a photograph, uh, here's a drawing, I'm sorry, by David Hardy, the astronomical artist, and this shows Uranus as it might be from one of its moons. Of course, it is only an artist's impression, it may very well be wrong, we just don't know, but at least it's reasonable. And you just happened to watch this section where they were talking about this Durr castle and uh, the telescope that was there, so I went and looked into it some more and came across this piece that was done by Sir Patrick Moore, who had a long-running television show on astronomy on the BBC for many decades. So this is back in the 60s, and he's talking with the, the current Earl of Ross, I believe. Um, you know. And this might really look like that. Hey everyone, I just wanted to share this little clip that I found um, recently. I'd actually been watching a, a documentary series just on Irish castles, uh, just for the fun of it, and 